The 6 o'clock news starts right now. More mental health team coverage, funding for public housing repairs, and more money for the city's animal care services department. Those are just some of the dozens of amendments city council members want to make before passing the city's $3.7 billion budget later this week. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger was there as council members tried to whittle down the various options. So Garrett, where are the big disagreements in all this? Honestly, Steve, right now it seemed relatively easy so far. The mayor even used the phrase an air of compromise being in the room. Of course, it helps that they have 20 million extra dollars to use after CPS Energy raked in a windfall the past couple months after selling energy out on the wholesale market. Now, there was really just one area with some very clear contention, the so-called reproductive, the reproductive justice fund. Now, a coalition of abortion advocacy groups have asked for a half million dollar fund to support organizations that provide reproductive and sexual health care services, resources and education. Now, they've been clear that one of the fund's uses would be logistical support for women seeking abortions out of state. That means transportation or lodging if they have to stay overnight. But in passing on the proposal to city staff, the council members have used language that's more open to interpretation. Though at least one councilwoman did confirm to us that helping groups doing this work is intended to be one of the purposes. And today she painted it as a way to back up council's resolution supporting abortion access last year. And I believe that we have a responsibility. I know when we passed the resolution, there was debate about um, what was actually tied to it and what we did have. And I believe now there's an opportunity to put some money behind that request. Uh. Meanwhile, the council's most conservative member, District 10 Councilman Mark White, has said that this idea is a non-starter for him. And I think there is um, significant legal exposure if we give money to organizations that fund folks' ability to travel outside of state lines and have abortions. That question of legal risk is still somewhat up in the air. The city attorney's office told us after the meeting that providing that kind of support would not be criminal under current case law. But depending on what kind of assistance the city actually pays for, it could have problems under a Texas law that allows individuals to sue anyone for aiding an abortion after six weeks. Ultimately, though, the council would still have to define exactly what this proposed fund would cover. Now, one of the more sweeping budget amendments that we were expecting to hear actually got pulled back. Councilwoman Melissa cabello Havreda had suggested last week that the city cut back how much money it takes from CPS Energy so as to avoid another rate increase by the utility. However, today, instead of proposing it as part of the budget, she says she wants to have a larger conversation, therefore kicking it on down the road a little bit longer. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Bernger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. One amendment that's all but in the budget is money for ballistic glass on San Antonio police vehicles. The proposal comes after a slew of shootings of SAPD officers. The city manager says he already told the police chief to begin working to equip 30 specialty unit vehicles like SWAT and street crimes with bulletproof windshields and side glass. And the city would order new patrol vehicles to come with that glass going forward after that. And we have an update tonight on a San Antonio police officer who was shot one week ago today. We now know that officer's name and his condition. According to SAPD, Officer Jose Bernal Rodriguez was shot while trying to arrest Dominic Rubio. Rubio was wanted on two felony warrants. That shooting happened in the 200 block of Iroquois Street on the southwest side. The officer is now recovering at home. SAPD also tells us that Bernal Rodriguez is recovering from his injuries. Rubio was arrested and charged with attempted capital murder of a police officer. Officer Bernal Rodriguez was the fifth officer shot by a suspect in a 12-day period. He believes the state's open carry law could be leading to more gun crime. That's a concern the Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez raised at last night's public safety town hall. The law allows Texas gun owners to carry without a license or training. The DA says people have a right to carry, but there are some people who he says have no business with a firearm. The discussion came on the heels of five San Antonio police officers shot in the span of two weeks. Nicole Golden is with the nonprofit Texas Gun Sense. 
She says it shows the impact of loosened gun restrictions. Not just San Antonio, it's really everywhere. All Texas communities are impacted by this crisis. The DA and the San Antonio Police Chief, William McManus, set to speak with the public again on Thursday. They'll both attend another town hall, this time in District 7 at the Doris Griffin Senior Center. Tonight, three men are facing several charges after San Marcos police say they kidnapped migrants and held them for ransom. San Marcos police say that Mason Castillo, Robert Cruz and Jeremiah Villarreal allegedly kidnapped at least 10 migrants last month. Police say they planned on taking them from Mexico to Austin. Officers say the three men took those migrants to a house in San Marcos. They kept them there until they paid the captors several thousand dollars, according to investigators. All three are now facing several charges, including kidnapping and smuggling. The $500. 500. That's how much a man on trial for capital murder was allegedly paid to kill someone. John Cantu on trial for being the alleged trigger man in this case. This entire murder for hire plot took the life of an innocent man. Erica Hernandez breaks down this case that involves three different co defendants. It was in this house in the 300 block of Ilg Avenue on the south side near Zasamora that Mike Bettis was shot five times. His body dumped alongside the road and found four days later, just about 200 feet from the home. Days later, investigators got a break and believe a murder for hire plot was executed on Perez to allegedly shift blame on him for something he didn't do. The three arrested, Manuel Cantu, his wife, Cristina Rodriguez, and Manuel's brother, John Cantu, who is now on trial for capital murder. There will be things that we do and don't have, but what we absolutely have is eyewitness testimony. That key eyewitness, Carmen Hernandez, was a babysitter for Manuel and Cristina. In testimony, she says Cristina was diluting drugs and needed to put the blame on someone else and picked Betis. Hernandez says she not only saw the murder happen, she witnessed the conversation about the plan and saw the exchange of money. Are you with Christina and John when they have a discussion about hurting Mike Pettis? Yes. He had told her that he needed bullets for the gun, and then she said, I got you. I you know, she was going to supply the bullets. Later, Hernandez says Christina gave John Cantu $500. Hernandez says Perez came over to the house that she shared with Cristina Emanuel and that Manuel Cantu severely beat Perez. She says after that, John Cantu shot Perez twice in the head and three times in the back. This is a non-death capital murder case. So what that means, if Cantu is found guilty, he is automatically sentenced to life in prison without parole. Now, testimony will continue here in the 186 tomorrow morning. At the Cadena Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Okay, our viewers didn't hear my very excited voice when I looked down <laughs> and saw the temperature in the corner of the screen. That's an improvement, Adam Kasky. Yeah, and her, her excitement was directed towards you. <laughs> it, it was. It, there was a, an element of shock in there as well, I will say. It was yeah. 92? <laughs> it, it was, you know, shock at first and then excitement at the end of it. Squeezed all in and 92. Yes, 95 was our high temperature today. That's four degrees above average for this time of year. And our second day in a row, we haven't hit 100. Look across the state. 70s for highs up north. Abilene 73, Midland 66 for the high temperature. Lubbock and Amarillo 70. Now, I wish I could tell you this is some fall air that's headed our way. They are on the cooler side of a weak boundary that's draped overhead, but also significant cloud cover helping to keep those temperatures down. Now, speaking of clouds, it does look like we'll have more of those with rain chances. We'll jump into that along with a space station viewing tonight. All of those details in a bit. Thank you, Adam. This month, we have been bringing front and center the critical issue of suicide prevention and letting veterans know about it. Today, we're continuing to do so with a particular focus on financial wellness. Financial struggles can be a big factor in a person's mental health. As our Jonathan Cotto reports, help is out there right now for those who have served our country. Phil Krabby, a former Marine, served three deployments to Iraq. So I was infantry, so... I was kicking in doors and getting into firefights. But he says that was the easy part. We drove down this road and uh, the vehicle in front of me exploded. 
and I lost instantly. I lost two of my guys and my interpreter and three others that were severely injured in that. He says what he saw and had to do on May 23rd, 2006 changed his life forever. I didn't know how to deal with it, so I just compartmentalized it and shut it off. Krabby says that led to years of alcohol and substance abuse. It was on November 30th, 2020 that Krabby was met head on with his depression. My depression kept telling me, you know, you can end this. And that particular day, I agreed with it. With the help of the VA and the Wounded Warrior Project, Krabby says it was easy to get the help he needed, but his finances were just adding to his problems. Something that Dr. Aaron Fletcher says can make symptoms of PTSD, anxiety, and depression worse in veterans. It's hard for somebody to think, you know, I should stop right now and, and probably seek some, some counseling. She says one in three of the warriors they serve who are experiencing financial insecurity are also experiencing suicidal thoughts. And we want to be the program that can, the organization that can provide you with the support and the skills to move through that without ending your life. All you need to do is you need to tell them that you're in crisis and you need help and they'll be able to guide you to where you need to go. Reporting front and center, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. If you'd like to see more of our front and center stories, scan this QR code you see right here. That will take you to the front and center page of KSAT.com. You can also find those stories on the KSAT YouTube channel. Check out traffic on this Tuesday and let's go to I-10 in Hackberry and you can see things moving along very smoothly in both directions. A little bit of a slowdown, but nothing major right now. Not like we saw at 5 at I-10 in Days of All. I want to tell you that that area has been cleared at this moment. That was a big mess earlier. Still ahead here on the news at 6, e-cigarettes have been linked to serious lung and cardiovascular diseases. But new studies show that vaping could cause more serious health complications. What signs you should watch out for after the break. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. This is really one of the summer's biggest stories. San Antonio firefighters putting out fires in empty buildings. We know that you've noticed tonight on the Night Beat. KSAT investigates, explores why that's happening and why fires in empty buildings are actually more difficult for firefighters. Plus, the San Antonio Independent School District is considering changes, and it's something that leaders at the San Antonio ISD are discussing right now as we speak. The district is holding a meeting tonight about something that it calls right-sizing. The idea there is to consolidate and close school campuses, what you can expect moving forward. We'll see you for these stories and so much more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephania. It's only been about 15 years since e-cigarettes or vape hit the market. It's extremely popular among young people, with some surveys showing that more than 3 million middle and high school students vaped last year alone. Yeah, e-cigarettes contain nicotine. They have been linked to lung and cardiovascular disease. But now Ursula Perry shows us how vaping could also increase your risk for cancer. E-cigarettes, vapes, jewels, they go by many names, but no matter what you call them, these devices are very popular. In fact, it's estimated that one in 10 people under 18 vapes, and a quarter of those young people vape every day. It's been known to cause a host of complications, including lung and heart disease, but new research suggests that vaping can increase your risk of oral cancer as well after exposure to e-cigarette vape, and that was independent of nicotine or nicotine content, a lot of the bacteria, the good bacteria, die. Which can lead to tooth decay and gum disease. Andel's research focuses on a particular bacteria that is found in the skin that can cause illness or death if it gets in the bloodstream. Usually when someone has a healthy immune system, it kills that bacteria. But this research suggests that vaping compromises that response, allowing the bacteria to grow. Hopefully, with some of the recent research that we have published and others, overall, it will lead to more awareness and hopefully it will change some of the policy making. And that can lead to healthier smiles. Some studies, though, suggest that the aerosol that is produced by the vape pen can cause changes to cells in just a matter of months. As well, they say that many of the chemicals that are found in that aerosol from the vape pen 
are cancer causing things like formaldehyde, heavy metals and other materials that can get lodged in the deepest part of your lungs. If you are a parent or guardian and you have a child who is interested in beginning to vape or is already vaping, it's probably time to have a talk so at least they know the risk. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Okay, trying not to get ahead of myself here, but I like the direction we are headed with the forecast. You seem a bit enthused I am. by all this. <laughs> I yeah. have needed something exciting in the forecast. I'm going to try to replicate what you said earlier when people couldn't hear you. <laughs> Nine. 92? Yeah. So I could, I, it was I definitely the, the, like the, the, Scooby -Doo the, the upswing was, on the two <laughs> was definitely part of it. Yeah, yeah. something like that. I was hey, excited. <laughs> we'll get to that. We're going to stay below 100. That's our forecast. But I want to get to our space station flyover visible this evening. Starting at 839 p.m. It's going to last six minutes, a max height of 84 degrees above the horizon. So that means it's almost going to be directly overhead in the middle of it. Basically, look to the southwestern horizon starting at 839 PM. I do want to point out we have some clouds out there, so not everybody's going to have perfect viewing. Take a look at the latest satellite imagery and you'll see the sky generally clearing out for most of Bear County and surrounding counties, but east east side of Bear County, we still have some lingering clouds, but some time for that to clear out between now and 836 PM. Here's the wider picture and you see a lot of the clouds from throughout the day today of uh, gradually falling apart and even moving out of town. Most of us should have decent viewing out there. Most of us should have decent viewing. I do want to point out we have one little downpour that popped up in northern Lavaca County, just northwest of Hallettsville there. We're in a type of weather pattern where it's a little unsettled, not very unsettled, a little unsettled where some of these can pop up at just about any moment. And here's the overall big picture. We've got this stationary boundary through Texas and even stretching into New Mexico, and it's right through our area. There are some cooler temperatures to the north of it, as I showed you earlier, also influenced by the clouds and shower activity in parts of North Texas, but that can help to trigger and instigate a few showers along with this very weak dip in the upper level flow, this little short wave that's going to be headed eastward. It might be just enough to enhance our rain chances a little bit tomorrow afternoon and evening. Here's one computer representation. This keeps most of the action north of San Antonio and then just starts to pop up some here and there in our area tomorrow afternoon and early evening. Again, this is one computer model representation which will be changing again, and I'll have that update coming up on the night beat at 10. As for the overall rain chances, we give it a 30% chance tomorrow, 20% Thursday, 40% on Friday. We boosted a little because of a little more of a shift in our pattern that should enhance those rain chances a bit, and then 20% Saturday. And that Friday does include Friday evening and Friday night. These numbers will be changing in the days ahead, so be sure to check back for updates. 93, the current temperature. Wait, 93? I'm going to say, well, I mean, well, so I'm going to think of it like that from now on. I mean, we've been, still been triple digits at this hour so often over the past several months, but not right now. Hondo 92, 97 in Pleasanton, Del Rio 96. Look at Junction at 77. That's what some clouds will do for you. Clouds and some areas of rain. Lubbock 67 right now in Midland at 66 degrees. Again, that's not some fall air, though. That's headed our way. Partly cloudy for us this evening, a northeast wind at 5 to 10. By 10 o'clock, we're 85 degrees. Midnight, we're at 80 degrees. We start the day tomorrow at 75. Then at noon, we're 87, 94 for the high. And there's that 30% chance tomorrow afternoon on into tomorrow evening. 89 for the high in comfort tomorrow. Bernie as well. Divine 94, Seguin 94, the high temperature. And overall, those highs will be below 100. We'll get close on Thursday, 98 the high. Otherwise, we should be uh, below that. And by the way, coming up at 645, I'll have an update on Lee and the tropics. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. I've noticed in 12's top 12, they keep slowly climbing. <laughs> Mary, I think 
the mules have something going on in Alamo Heights. They are proving a lot to start the year and putting up some insane numbers. The Alamo Heights football team has dominated their way to a 3-0 start to the season. And the Spurs wave guard campaign, what that means for the roster. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. It's safe to say that the Cowboys defense had a feast on Sunday night against the New York Giants. The Cowboys defense only allowed 63 net passing yards, which were the fewest net passing yards allowed in a Cowboys season opener since 1974. The hard hits led to the domination of the game, including the hit Trayvon Diggs had on Saquon Barkley, which led to Darren Bland returning the interception for a touchdown. Defensive coordinator Dan Quinn was elated by the play. I was really proud of him for that. Um, it was a great hit. I don't think he could time it up any better on the one that uh, Bland got the interception on. So and then knocking another one out later. So it's really having a, a mindfulness approach to get the football. So it's part of our game that we really want to emphasize as often as we can without putting ourselves in a vulnerable spot. You know, you can't take a shot when you're going to make a tackle. You make the tackle. You make the hit. And I thought that's what it showed on Trayvon's hit that caused the interception. He wasn't going in there trying to. He was going in there to hit. And, and good things came from that. The Cowboys will host an Aaron Rodgers list New York Jets team for their home opener this Sunday at 325 in the evening. The San Antonio Spurs have decided to waive veteran point guard Cameron Payne nearly two months after the team acquired him in a deal with the Suns. In the trade, the Spurs sent a protected second round draft pick to Phoenix and in return they received Payne a second round pick and cash. This move gets the Spurs closer to the 15 player roster limit. Prior to waiving Payne, there were 20 on the active roster. District 14 5A D2 powerhouse Alamo Heights is averaging about 65 yards per game throughout the first three games of the season and the Mules scoring margin against only district opposition is an impressive 139. Though even with the Mules potent attack and suffocating defense, the group refuses to take any opponent lightly. Next, undefeated McCollum awaits the arrival of Alamo Heights and head coach Ron Riddiman is preaching staying humble to his group. The cool thing is I don't think we've reached our full potential. We're getting better week by week and that's kind of the process that we try to implore on our guys is just set the bar the first game and then be a little better the second game. We make sure to respect all our opponents. I mean, at the end of the day, we know it's about us, what we do, we control what we can. We just can't think of ourselves too highly. We need to go in like we do every game and just it's a new team every week. We need to look at it that way. Last year, the Mules went undefeated in its district schedule and finished the year as regional semifinalists. McCollum and Alamo Heights kick off at 7 this Friday. They averaged 65 points a game? A game. Wow. One of those games was an 81-0 to zero final. Wow. <laughs> oh good, so it's a good way to start the year. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Mary. Mary. Our KSAT Q&A with Mayor Ron Nirenberg is next.